let me get a formal intro in. Oh, yeah, and then we yeah, can really yeah. kind of like get the get the whole thing going. All right. Hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. I hope you are doing well. Uh, today, we are embarking on an interview and conversation with I, I, I was thinking of words to describe you by other than just like YouTuber, because we're just both, you know, YouTubers. Video I was, essayists. I was going to say, and... I mean, even that, even that I was going to say uh, cultural critic. I was going to okay, say I, I was going to say modern philosopher. I'll I take was going that. to say a uh, fellow Don't say thought was, leader. Uh, okay. <laughs> not, not thought leader. Fellow old head. Ah, indeed. indeed. Uh, Mr. FD Signifier, uh, who I've had a lot of conversations about music and culture uh, with for a while behind the scenes, but I feel like his uh, latest video uh, about the problem or paradox when it comes to white rappers was a great opportunity for us to kind of cross over and have a conversation on here uh, about hip hop, about music in general. And, um, you know, I mean, the very topic that your video is about. Um, th there's a lot of things that I want to get into with this video. I think it's a great video. I mean, for one, I was, uh, you know, really pleased to see, and I highly recommend everybody watching right now, watch the video, go look up the new FD signifier video, you know, cue it up. If you haven't seen it, watch it after this conversation. Um, you know, personally, I love the way you broke down so much of the popular music history, you know, leading up to Eminem and beyond and talking about rap rock and, you know, a host of other things. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into all that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's an excellent video. It covers a lot of bases. Uh, Let me clarify something really quickly. Yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. so weird to me how people will watch a video and just hear random things I've never said. I did not call Rage Against the Machine cringe. And, oh, and maybe yeah, I yeah. just didn't enunciate that. Like, like I you, love you, like, you. You referred to them as being in that rap rock block, but like right. it's it's. I understand because I lived through that era. That like regardless of whether or not there are some good bands that came out of that movement, Rage, Lincoln Park, so on and so forth. Like critically speaking, that whole time period is looked back upon through a lens right. of cringe, right. because it is often the limp biscuits that kind of like dominate the narrative around that music. The butterfly and, guys. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, no, no, I, I, I get what you were saying there. I yeah. didn't, even though Rage love is personally, me some Rage, against the machine. Rage yeah. is personally one of my favorite bands of all time, but like, you know, I didn't take what you said as a shot against them. You know, yeah. that's just, if, if you're a younger listener or viewer, you may not necessarily understand kind of like the fact that so many people our age lived through that era, enjoyed that stuff, but then simultaneously around the 2000s silently started going, I can't believe I did that. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. So it's like, you know, you're, you're kind I'll of even living. Admit, I like Limp Biscuit. I, I, I think Chocolate Starfish was maybe when I got off the, the, the train a little bit. But Mo like, as most people were. Yeah. Most yeah. people. Yeah. But everything up until that point, fucking, I, I was singing Nookie. I'll admit that shit. You know, I, you know? I I will say one time it was I think it was like a private Patreon stream. I was like really feeling myself for my own memory at that point, and I was like, you know what, guy? Like I was just it just popped in my head, I said, guys, you know what went really fucking hard? The first Limp Biscuit album, man, it went so fucking hard. Like the riffs were this, this was that, and I was like talking it up so much, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna play some of it. I put it on, it sucked fucking ass, and I was like, <laughs> and not only that, but like the recording was bad, and the drums and the bass were off, and they weren't even like linked up all that time. I was like, man, I didn't remember how much this sucks, <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, guys, I lied to you. I didn't, I didn't really mean to talk it up like that. <laughs> But, but uh, nostalgia goggles will do that too. They they yeah. will. They absolutely positively will. You know, which which again is 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 a part of the reason why I thought this video was so great because you you didn't you know sort of like necessarily look at the past with rose colored glasses and I thought you broke down a lot of this like you know kind of white rapper related history in an effective and really clear and concise way so that people who are younger than us can like get it and can understand yeah. how all of these figures who are out there today kind of came to be and you know and 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 help people understand the fact that we do live in this era now where you know, today's white rappers, for the most part, are very much just influenced by Eminem and much of the time singularly influenced by Eminem, whereas like he and many rappers of his generation, uh, you know, regardless of their whiteness and whatever sort of like, you know, uh, shortcomings may come as a result of that in terms of their personal experience and how they can kind of relay that in their music, they were at least influenced by, 
you know, sort of like the the black godfathers right. of rap and had some sort of like understanding or conception of the world and the philosophy that hip hop music came from. And now it sort of yeah. seems like, you know, a lot of white rappers and, and even rappers generally are kind of getting more distant from that due to the way capitalism kind of, you know, separates it art just, from the roots and the culture and the politics it may be born out of. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I wanted yeah. to ask you to kind of kicks this video off and give people like an idea as to what they're getting into with this video. Uh, just explain to the audience in as concise a way as you can what for you kind of the white rapper problem or paradox is. It starts with people asking me to make a video about Jack Harlow. Mm. So I'm sure you've had it where like, talk about this, you know, because sure, you know, sure. the, the thought leader moniker that I don't want to own is because, it's funny, I just had a conversation with a, another creator. We get on here, if you're talented, you know, can speak in front of a mic, don't look, you know, completely unhinged and, and dis disheveled. Uh, the screen does something magical to kind of turns you into a, a public intellectual, even though I'm only really qualified to talk about a handful of things. Right. Um, and even then, I don't want to talk about every part of that thing. And so people request access like they request a take from you based on their perception of your intellect and your your, you know, worldview. And so people are requesting me to talk about Jack Carlo all through 2022. Hmm. And I'm like, why? And that was in, that was in the video. Like, why, why, like, like, how don't y'all know what's happening here that I can, like, I really want to do other things. I don't want to talk about Jack Carlo. And then I sat and I thought about it and I was like, man, there's a profound, that's profound there that uh, this very mediocre um, kind of run of the mill you know, commercial package of, of Jack Harlow has grabbed a hold of hip hop's, you know, timing for a moment so that everybody has to talk about, it. you know, you have to give your Jack Harlow take. And uh, I, I, I can't remember the last time that happened. The last time that happened was probably Kendrick coming, mm. coming into like prominence. Mm. And so you look at the difference artistically between Jack Harlow and Kendrick, you're like, okay, so how is this happening? And the obvious answer is Jack Harlow is a white rapper. Mm. And so that means something. And so I started to ask, try to figure out, well, what does that mean? And why does that mean so much? Um, and how do I convey that to people that don't quite get it? Like everybody feels it. Like you kind of feel like it's obvious to say it's cause Jack Harlow's white. Hmm. But that's oversimplified because um, I don't know. There's a guy named Russ. Isn't that a white rapper? That's kind yeah, of like I, I know Russ. I've reviewed Russ. We, I've interviewed Russ. We, we know Russ. Right. So there's a guy named Russ. I'm not familiar with his music, but like hmm. I didn't hear that about Russ. Hmm. I don't hear that about Marlon Craft. You know hmm. what I'm saying? Um, insert other rappers. I don't know your old Drew, all these other like much less commercially viable uh, white rappers. You're not getting that. Hmm. But it, it's, it's explicitly because Harlow and I really wonder about this. You, you mentioned earlier um, kind of like the decision tree of, a, of being a white rapper and like where you want to take it, which elements of angst you're interacting with in terms of like how you perceived and, and where you go. So Harlow said, I want to be the biggest rapper. I have I have the backing. I, I'm cool with Drake. I'm cool with insert other viable artists here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going straight for the top. Mm -hmm. And he gets there mostly without actually earning that spot. And I really wish I, I, I had I, I had spent more time comparing him to Vanilla Ice because I, I'm, I don't have a lot of like animosity towards Harlow and what he's doing because I don't think he realizes in a weird way how he's being set up for failure. If from my perspective. Yeah. Um, and, and just to let people know in your video, you don't have a lot of animosity toward Vanilla Ice either. No, you know, I, I was very nice to Vanilla Ice. In a, you in a you were incredibly way. nice to Vanilla Ice. And, uh, you know, I, I think um, you put into perspective even some things that, like, I, uh, even having lived through that era, sort of, like, forgot myself, like, looking at him and his rise to fame, you know, a lot of people, as you said, sort of look at him like he's a culture vulture and he's this and he's that. But the thing is, like, he's the first guy. He had no conception of, like, how far he could go, what was going to happen, what 
possible impact he could have on the genre, whatever we know of sort of like, you know, white culture vultureism, like he was the archetype who was kind of just moving through the motions as it was kind of playing out before him. He couldn't, he's not Nostradamus, right. you know, he couldn't predict right. the future and he didn't understand all of what was unfurling in front of him at that time. Yeah. So, you know, you, you can't really debate that whether or not what he was doing did come from a place of passion because it's not like there was a financial or social incentive to him kind of, you yeah. know, like he, he, being in being in the trenches in the way that he was before he yeah. hit it big. People don't understand the trenches like existing back then. Like now the trenches is your living room with I was about to say Fruity Loops. I don't know if Fruity right. Loops is even viable anymore. <laughs> um I, I, now, I, I think I think it's still a little viable. Okay. But yeah, but now the trenches is like your own basement and a lot of TikTok and Spotify uploads, right? Yeah. A lot of this is the trenches. Yeah. Before the trenches was nightclubs, hole in the walls, nightly, daily, uh, selling tapes. Out yeah, of you actually trunk. had to cross social boundaries. Right. You had to do so much. And like when I researched him and saw he was a he was a backup dancer and joining dance groups and rap groups for like a decade before getting his big break was becoming a regular performer at one nightclub. Right. That somebody happened to find him at. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, like, y you know, you you got to you got to you have to respect that that takes a level of investment in hip hop to want to connect to. And and while there is there, there still was even then a level of, of privilege that came with being a white guy in the space. There's also like a ton of barriers, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? That he had to travail through to get to a point to then access the privilege. Like as soon as he got spotted by the industry, the industry knows, knows, knows what's up. The industry ran with him, but everybody else up until that point was like, get your corny ass out of here. And he had to kind of consistently reprove himself to every other uh, other situation. And it, it, it makes sense that that might give him, that might have gave him a distorted sense of what his reality was once he got to the top. Sure. When I watched that Arsenio Hall um, interview, they're so contentious and I completely get Arsenio. I'm pretty much on Arsenio's side because Arsenio's trying to get him to realize what's actually happening. Right, right. And he's like, no, I'm Vanilla Ice. I worked really hard to get here. People are hating on me for no reason. Yada, yada, yada. And Arsenio's like, no, it's a reason. And I wish you would understand it because this isn't going to work. This isn't going to go well for you at the end of the day. And obviously, <laughs> Arsenio was right at the, end of the, at the end of the day. Yeah. No, I mean, well, for anybody who's, you know, kind of popping into the conversation, what we are talking about in so many words right now is literally like the white rapper paradox that you talk about in your video. You know, Vanilla Ice kind of sets it up in a lot of ways, even though, like you say, you know, there's there's not a lot of reasons to have kind of animosity toward him because, you know, he's not conscientious of what's happening to him in that moment. But also in that Arsenio Hall interview, as I'm just recalling now, he he does, as he says in the conversation, have a conception of, uh, you know, that kind of like cultural voyeurism or, you know, being opportunistic in that way from the standpoint of Elvis, mm. you know, being a white figure in a black genre and the way he, he didn't sort like of that. like, well, he, he didn't like that, but it's like, doesn't the, the, the conception of Elvis being seen in that way enough to sort of like parrot that line in front of a black audience in order to get an applause line make him culpable or aware enough of it in, in that situation to maybe be more critical of him and be like, you, you probably could have done better because, you know, even if what you're doing now is different because it is hip hop, it's a different era mm -hmm. of music, it's a different genre, it's a different culture. But in so many ways, it did kind of play out the same way. I mean, obviously, in a much less glamorous way, because, you know, he didn't come out with as much good music, and he's not seen as like, you know, this classic figure yeah. in, in so many ways, but still, um, you know, he, he had enough of a concept of that playing out in rock music. So, you know, why, why do you think he didn't sort of make that same connection? I don't think he actually had a ton of a con a big concept of it. Hmm. I think so. The other part of this video is funny. I got a comment uh, in the video, uh, maybe sometime yesterday, who said, I see Derek Bell all through your uh, this video. Mm. And for those who don't know, Derek Bell is the father of critical race theory. Mm. And what I've been doing in between like overtly political stuff, right? Like a fuck the police or the black service view or whatever. Like I always lace my content with, we'll say the the 
greatest hints to like the 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 trappings of certain um radical political ideologies and so this video in and of itself is a video about whiteness and race abolition sure if if, if you catch it and and w- what i think the goal once so one of the other goals of the video was to put those white uh, those that those white fans that i have into a position where they think critically about what whiteness means because the way that racism and white supremacy and et cetera works is that whiteness is invisible. Like the concept of whiteness and white supremacy is mostly invisible until, you know, somebody gets ki- a, a black guy gets murdered by the police and then everybody kind of gets it for a short period of time. But in between, it's like it kind of floats into the ether. And going back to Vanilla Ice, I think he understood that the Elvis comparison was an insult. Mm. Right. Mm. But I don't think he fully got that the especially in the you know this is 90 89 mm. i don't think he fully got that what they're insinuating is how elvis stole um rock on on accident right because right, right. i think elvis gets actually upon research elvis gets a little bit of a bad rap as well um in terms of how much effort he put into staying connected to his his original um influences but, I mean, he he himself also had to cross over in through cultural boundaries, and 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 he was even more of an archetype than Vanilla Ice was. He had no concept right. of how far he could take what he was doing at the time that it was happening. Right, and so and so that is the concept of that's the that's kind of the paradox in and of itself is that when you don't have a concept of whiteness, especially in terms of how whiteness acts upon minority spaces. Mm just by you being there, um, then you are going to have a na- a very understandable defense mechanism to being racialized in those moments. So sure. ICE just thought they're hating on me because I'm white, because I'm white. Whereas Arsino's like, you don't understand, these people cheering never cheered for a black rapper, but they're cheering for you. And that means something. Um, and, and ice also said in that section and, and here, here's kind of the gist of it. He's like, I'm bringing hip hop to people that never listened to it before. Right. And Arsenio is kind of like, so what do you think that means? What do you think is happening there? What is that? What should that be revealing to you, uh, as a, as the centerpiece of that attention? And the, 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 the challenge is trying to, uh, effectively, have that bubble burst be something that's an inception moment as opposed to me lecturing. Like I, I never want to make the here's how racism works video. Um, I will eventually. I got, I got one plan. Those do numbers. Um, but you know, and, but part, part of the reason for that is if I become the authority on the concept and, and I'm like the per, the person attached to that awakening, then it becomes kind of my responsibility and it's less effective. Mm. Whereas I think people, going through kind of a, of a race consciousness growth experience, it becomes a more useful experience overall. And I don't think Vanilla still gets, it, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I think it no, it's, 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 it's a hard thing to get because the thing is like, it, you know, I understood the vast majority of the concepts that you were saying in the video. Um, and, you know, I mean, I was... I, I guess what I'm tr- the point I'm trying to ultimately make here is like a lot of the stuff that you were saying. In order to understand them, you either have to have long studied music culture or have like a sociology degree, you know. And the thing is, like, it, it doesn't matter how old or experienced you are if you're not using that time that you have on this planet to put in that work to understand. Of course, you're going to become as old as fucking Vanilla Ice is and still not get it. You know, it's like just because you sort of went through that experience doesn't necessarily mean that you sort of like, you know, you got the lesson. Put, yeah, that you got the lesson or that you put in the work to understand it. Um, you know, but the question I want to ask off of that is, you know, I, I could sort of see what you're saying in terms of like him responding to Arsenio saying, well, I'm bringing hip hop to an audience of people who, who wouldn't have listened to it. But I think one thing, you know, despite the Elvis comparison that he didn't really understand at that time. And I feel like, you know, maybe we didn't even fully understand until Eminem, who obviously Mm -hmm. pushed hip hop to an even larger and bigger audience of people is that, you know, the effect that we're seeing at least on some level, 
enough for it to be a factor. I, I don't know how much of a factor. You know, I, 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 we would have to sort of pull people, but you know, there are a lot of people who, you know, they get introduced to hip hop through Vanilla Ice, or they get introduced to hip hop through Eminem, and maybe on some level they think they're doing like this genuinely good deed in terms of like, yeah, I'm bringing this to a larger group of people. The audience is like, you know, being turned on to this genre of music they wouldn't have listened to otherwise. But uh, there's a lot of people who are only listening to you because you're white and they're only listening to you. And that's right. it. Just because they're listening to you doesn't mean they're actually digging deeper into the culture in the way that you did. And I think that's what, unfortunately, and, and sometimes I'm guilty of this as well, uh, just because you've put in the effort as a white person to try to understand doesn't mean that once you expose that to another white person that they're going to do the same thing. Or that right. they're going to actually try to put in the effort to dig deep and get a real conception of like where this comes from and, you know, why an artist like Kendrick, you know, th there are a lot of white people I'm sure saw that whole Macklemore Kendrick thing at the Grammys and were just like, w w what's the big deal? You know, the thing is like, you, you, you have to be a real hip hop fan to understand why that's an upset. You know, it's right. like why, why that that does not make sense. There's no At possible <laughs> way, even if a lot of the songs on that Macklemore record are catchy. There's no like once you listen to that Kendrick album and you see how great it is conceptually and musically and you understand. Hold on, was that T Pal that that he beat? That that was, that 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 was Good Kid, Mad City. That was Good Kid, Good Mad, Kid Mad City. City. That's even that's even worse. That's a, <laughs> in a way, it's even worse in a way because like it's a more commercially viable album. You know, you you could see the Grammys just looking at T Pab and not fucking getting it. But let's, yeah, but I can understand like, that. But Good Kid, Mad City is like. <laughs> it's 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 like fucking Lion King in terms of it's like universal enjoyability, you know, and storytelling right. and so on and so forth, you know. So the thing is like, you know, you have to be a real hip hop fan to sort of see that and be like, this makes no sense. This does not compute. Right. This does not compute. Right. There's something wrong here, you know. But but because there's a lot of people, you know, are sort of listening to the genre casually and don't really understand what would yeah. make an album like that more significant, they're just going to look at that and shrug their shoulders. Or, you know, again, at the end of the day, they'll use Macklemore as an entry point to listen to hip hop then, or get into and it. And then but stay they, in the entryway. And then the stay time. stay in the entryway. They just stay it's, in the entryway. It, uh, I, would, uh, I can't remember who, somebody cool watched the video and was like, you know, reminds me of the fact that Eminem kind of hates a lot of his fans. <laughs> and he does. He actually he, does. He, he does. He does. And and like you, you we, we under you know, I, somebody told me that Gen Z never really tried to cancel Eminem. So if I was wrong about that, I'm sorry. But like <laughs> some of the criticism around Eminem is like that he purposely created this massive toxic fan base, right? Um, but if you actually go back and listen to his music, he's constantly telling his fans to fuck off. Telling his fans, if you only listen to me, you're shitty. Telling his fans, if I, if, if I let's do the math. If I were black, I'd probably sell half. Like that's that's like the second album, and, and, and also telling his fans not to act like him. Yes, that's yes. Like, so so much he's he's trying to, but he, you know, that is the that is, again that's the paradox. Like he, Eminem, you know, like, like, don't get me wrong, Eminem is not like I, I watched another good video. I wish I could remember this guy's name. Let me shout him out later. Um, I watched this video. He said, it's like Eminem is not your ally. He said Eminem's politics are probably like Joe Rogan. So like, let's not make Eminem into like this ultra uh, ally guy. But, you know, he did do his best to be like critical of the position he took. And I would argue that his, uh, I imagine, I'm not going to argue. I imagine that his disposition towards his fans and his overall discomfort with like being Eminem mm. is part of the reason why he entered into this late career uh, trajectory of making like a different type of hip hop. Like Eminem could easily be making songs with insert any top tier rapper right now. Like he very easily could, but he's making songs with logic. You know what I'm saying? Like he doesn't have to do that, but I think he's more comfortable kind of leaning into that alternative hip hop indie space because it it absolves him of some responsibility to manage this <laughs> this critical development of a fan base that is incredibly unprepared to do that. You right. know, they heard him in them. They heard lose yourself. You know what I'm saying? They put it in their workout mix, <laughs> and then they voted for Donald Trump. Like it's <laughs> right. You know, it, so it's uh like I, I can understand him being like, you know what? I'm gonna just leave that alone. 
and hope somebody figures that out for them. Um, Cause I think that's completely true. You get this and I have that. So like, and to, to, to empathize, I have white fans who have watched all of my videos and heard me say all of the things. And, and I've tried to, you know, manage and escalate and deescalate at times the, the, the antagonism I have toward, you know, uh, whiteness and, and white supremacy in my content to make it palatable uh, at times. And it doesn't matter either way. They still don't get it. There's a certain amount that still don't get it. And and it, they may get it eventually, right? It may be some other experience or thing they encounter that makes them understand it. Right. But that that when you're trying to make art and say my art also has a responsibility of the social political development of these people, black, white, or otherwise, uh, it is a almost it's, it's a challenge that's almost unfair to an extent. And then when you're Eminem, who again, Joe Rogan uh album, hip hop guy, is is not we're maybe expecting too much, you know? Mm. Yeah, I mean it's 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 not to say anybody's absolved, but it's a lot to ask of some random music fan, you know, who again has uh you're talking about asking a genre of entertainment to do a job that that frankly the school system should be doing and also overcome social barriers that much of the time are there by design through right. segregation through redlining through you know whatever host of existing or pre-existing systems uh kept society racially separate and disconnected Right. And that's that's a tall order for a rapper, you know, to right. sort of like for, to for for the one white kid in a black area from the Detroit suburbs for you know? for a white rapper for a rap, black rapper for anybody, you know, yeah. to 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 speak to any audience that is clued out of, which again, many of them are clued out of it because it's by design. The, right. It's the the system makes sure that they're clued out of it. Right. Um, to, and, and to, then we and then we consider how the we're we're also talking about a commercial a commercial industry right that picks and chooses. Which, you know, you know, one of the, the points I most proud to make, and I, I don't know when I'll return to it, is that the Ghetto Boys, for my money, top three hip hop group, you know, maybe like the Roots tribe, the Ghetto Boys, in, in my opinion, if I had to force it, the Ghetto Boys have minimal cachet in like, in, in the same hip hop circles that would proclaim the roots and tribe sure. as greats, sure. the ghetto boys don't have a lot of space there. Um, and it's because, uh, shout out to Turb. Turb helped me realize this point when he compared Kendrick to Chief Keef hmm. and talked about the fact that Kendrick and Chief Keef are talking about the exact same things in their music, believe it or not. Hmm. It's just Chief Keef, Chicago drill style. It's it's not gonna it's only going to appeal to a, a, a so much of an audience and I and I'm not even super included in that audience, um, and that forces him into a category. I kind of lost train of thought here. It forces him. It forces them into separate categories in terms of what they're talking about, even though what they're talking about is actually the same exact thing. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of just speaks to um, how you can't rely on a commercial industry to be very, to have any level of responsibility in a social political development of, of, of a community or a fan base, et cetera. You can try your hardest, you should do your part, right? But it's kind of a, a, a wasteful effort to be overly critical mm -hmm. of how these figures fail to do their part or don't do enough. Um, when that, that should be you, you know, marching in the streets uh, around your your actual pol politicians actions you know what i'm saying mm. i i think uh i want to get into this next big question because i i i think it's something that you didn't explicitly put in your video and maybe that's like for a reason um i mean we could go off of what you were just saying but i i think oh, no, no. Know, people who have been watching have maybe enough of an idea as to what we're kind of inferring when we talk about kind of the white rapper paradox but like in your in your view is the white rapper paradox escapable is it avoidable not, because it, not it, you know as, as 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 i saw in your video there are like some artists who you kind of shout out and point to in terms of like 
you could see that they're white and they didn't necessarily get in the position that they're at because maybe they're just like doing it good for a white guy, you know? Um, and, and, you know, examples that stand out like that are like LP and Aesop Rock, you know, right. I mean, Aesop Rock is continually cited, continually cited as like having immensely great flows and also being one of the most verbose rappers ever, you right. know, up there with Jizza and beyond. Um, right. So there's that. But then simultaneously, he doesn't also have this negative overarching impact on the culture that kind of dominates everything. And he's like outselling everybody. You know, he's, he's always stayed pretty underground. You know, he's, right. he's always stayed pretty underground, stayed true to his craft and necessarily sort of like, you know, sell out. And you can say the same for LP, too. So, I mean, you know, through that, have they kind of like avoided the paradox or sidestepped it a little in a way? So so I would argue they haven't avoided the paradox, mm. but they have minimized the damage, mm. if that makes sense. I think the paradox, as, as long as we're under white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, mm. insert left wing, you know, progressive talking points there. As long as that exists, then there will always have there will always be that the potential for those problems sure. or that that impact will always be there. But. By, you know, you made a good point when we, when we talked. You could eat, I'm sure at this point, you could easily have insert popular rapper here um, standing next to you every other time we see. You know what I'm saying? You could very much be, I don't, I don't, you, you, I don't want to name names, but you could very much be insert white hip hop figure. Yeah, yeah. The, the point I was making when we had that conversation was if, if I wanted to spend all day sort of aligning myself with hip hop culture by being like, look at me, I'm hanging out with this guy. Look at me, I'm hanging out with this guy. Aren't I so hip hop? I, I could do that, but I'm not, right. I'm not desperate to do that because I don't want to sell myself to anybody as anything that I'm not. You know, right. like I have, an, I have an opinion on it just, just like I would any other music album. You know, obviously it's different you know, culturally and socially, but uh, you know, that's, that's my approach. And I figure treating it like everything else is the best way to, as you were kind of saying earlier, because I have my own impact too, just like a white rapper would, um, minimizing damage. You know, right. I feel like treating hip hop as a special case positively or negatively and, you know, uh, making it obvious to people that I'm like desperately seeking the approval of hip hop fans and hip hop culture would probably not have a great outcome, not just for me, but also for the genre in general and the artists I'm covering. Yeah. The, 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 the shout out to John Lewis, the right wing hip hop blogosphere thing is a, is a, is a thing. It's, is that it's a thing? Happening. I think, I think it's a thing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, again, we won't, let's not get into shitting on certain people, but like, it's definitely a thing from my perspective, but, but I, I brought that up to say, that the the damage starts when you kind of bite the cookie. And, and and if I'm fair, I think everybody should be avoiding the cookie at this point in terms of like, how can I become a hip hop megastar? Because it's all exploitative, right. um, regardless of who's uh, in front of the, uh, got the microphone. The, the cookie being like the ladder to the top. Just right, like the ladder going, to the top. Going full cash cow. Right, like every nobody's innocent in that process. But specifically in how hip hop historically is operated as a culture and with the origins of hip hop and with hip hop's radical potential, when you are, if, if ASAP rock decided to um, start doing features with Drake, you know what I'm saying? Or back in when he started getting, when he first came out, Jay-Z or 50 cent or Ja Rule. So he could put himself out there as the next white rapper he would have still been very clever, still had amazing flows, et cetera. But, you know, he would have kind of created a, a bigger gravitational pull um, of this white kind of, you know, almost parasitic fan base that is damaging to the culture as a whole. And the next thing you know, we have Lil Mabu. You know what I'm saying? Can I, can I blame Eminem for Lil Mabu? Probably not. But can I draw a straight line from Eminem to Lil Mabu? <laughs> Pretty easily. You know what I'm saying? Um, and like that's kind of that is that is what if I had to give advice, I actually had a, I cut a little bit of this out, but if I had to give advice for white people looking to participate in hip hop, whether as artists or as purveyors, 
it's just think about the unintended consequences of your aspirations. Mm. You know, think about how you think about why, how you got there in the first place. Right. Are you here because you really love hip hop or are you here because you want to be like insert hip hop figure? And that's two different. Those two slightly different, I think, um, rationales. The And then also consider like what hip hop means and it's like value for black people in terms of like how it's a uh, a unique language that we speak that in some cases is the only language we get to operate in with, you know, freely. And so now you're kind of like taking up space and it's like, all right, we can work around you. But as you take up more and more space, it's like you're not leaving space for the rest of us. I, I really I cut a metal. I cut a, a visual um, about like uh, just the other week, Kamala Harris was in Atlanta. And so they shut down the expressway. Um, and that's kind of like when people uh, when people say, you know, stay in your lane. That's what they're talking about. They're not saying don't drive on the road. But when Kamala Harris comes to town, nobody else gets to be on the road. Um, when Eminem is hot, the roots don't get their 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 accolades the the you know common all these people I, I mentioned they don't get the 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 uh, the piece of the pie that they deserve and they don't get to have the impact on the culture that maybe would have been valuable at the time because we're listening to the Eminem show people in the comments are like Eminem show was a classic <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> no <laughs> but I love that for you you know um, I'm rambling a bit, but you kind of get no, no. What, like what, you're ta- what you're talking about, I, I would like to know wh- what you're talking about is also kind of based in a certain paradigm in terms of like music consumption culture, mm. uh, it, where I could understand maybe sort of like music popularity and exposure being a bit more of a zero sum game because you're talking about sort of like you know all of this stuff being pumped through traditional media pipelines like MTV and music mag- magazines and so on and so forth. Uh, do you feel like now with streaming and YouTube and social media it's less of a social it's less of kind of like a zero sum game and that you know regardless of how white you are big you are whatever um you know it, it, there there's a quote unquote like sort of enough pie for everybody and whoever wants to see whatever can just click on it and it's not necessarily being fed to them you know in the same yeah. way that you know maybe broadcast television would um in a way that's kind of like a tr- two things to be true at, uh, at once type situation so it's possible for, you know, um, remember uh, he had a couple of hits a couple of years ago. Don't know going back to you, baby. What is this guy's name? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, he was an artist a little while ago from Jacksonville. And according to what I got from his story, he literally just started making music in his basement and suddenly had like a top 100 hit on the Billboard charts, Right. So like that can happen. And, you know, and that's that's great. But there's also consequences to that. Yada, yada, yada. Um, if you know it's white, we're probably still hearing more about him right now. And so that's kind of the the, the paradox is that, you know, was a, uh, you know, large black guy with free form locks. And so the algorithm gives everybody a shot at the at the pie. But everybody doesn't get the same shot at the same size pie. And so it kind of makes things better in that you don't have to go through the gatekeepers, you know, to get an opportunity to make music. I probably, you know, I shouted out uh, 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 Kenny Mason and like there's so much of the newer rappers that I love, I don't think could have existed in the early 2000s, um, which is my heyday. Like, I don't think we could have gotten, um, you know, Kenny Mason and Denzel Curry, a lot of these guys, I don't think they'd have really had a shot at true hip hop stardom. Denzel Curry in the early 2000s? No, probably not. Yeah, probably not, right? Um, So the fact that we can have them now is amazing. Right. At the same time, we also still can only get so much of the pie. So we can't, we can't overplay that this access to the, to the, to the pie is greater but it's also just as distant. You see what I'm saying? It's, like it's, it's distant, but does like the existence of Jack Harlow mean that there's less pie for that guy or, or, or less pie for Danny Brown or anybody? Because, you know, to me, regardless of, you know, the, 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 
the racial dynamic there. They're also making two completely different styles of music. It's like, yeah. you know, n- n- somebody who's seeking out what Jack Harlow does was it, never going <laughs> it was, it was to listen to Danny Brown's atrocity exhibition to begin with, right? you know, right. Uh, essentially. But there, there probably are maybe, you know, six or a dozen other rappers that maybe sonically are more aligned to Jack Harlow that, yeah, mm-hmm. maybe there are some fans out there who are listening to him instead of like, you know, a, a dude who's making the next What's Poppin' or something. <laughs> I, 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 the pie is even I think one thing you're actually getting at is that the pie is just maybe smaller in general for everybody mm. if that makes sense it's it's right. harder it's harder to tell with the way things are consumption uh, you know in terms of like consumption right now because you know at least when we were all sort of like in this broadcast monoculture you had mm. a concept of like how much tv there was in a day how much radio right. there was in a day how much you know how many issues of a magazine came out that everybody could right. possibly be seeing or consuming. Now, you, you don't know how much TikTok someone's watching in a day. It's, I mean, if, yeah. if you wanted to, it could be 24 hours. You know, right. it could be 24 hours. And even within, even within that span, one person could watch 1,000 videos. One person could watch 3,000. Right. You know, within that same span of time, uh, somebody could be streaming uh, a two-hour long experimental concept, you know, post-rock, whatever album. You know, a certain number of times, or somebody could be listening to uh, a new two-minute Lil Nas X single dozens and dozens of dozens of times. You don't know. You don't know. It's right. it's it's hard to tell how much consumption is going on. And even when you look at somebody's Spotify page in terms of like, oh, they have a two million monthly listeners. Even then, it's it's hard to gauge. Right, like what that even really means, especially yeah. with songs being an hour and forty-five seconds these days, and, and also bots. Right. Right. Uh, so I think what we're really then talking about is not so much like the individual creators piece of the pie that they earn through their art, but also the presence in like the cultural zeitgeist. Mm. So like, so my, my kids could probably pick Jack Harlow out of a lineup Mm. because we turn on, you know, the TV on Thanksgiving and he's doing the, the, this halftime show, um, we, you know, we see him in commercials, we see him win BET awards, et cetera. And so with, with black folks in particular for hip hop, we're talking about low key erasure. Mm. And, and that's where it gets, that's where the, the day, the, un, the unseen danger comes from is that which ideas and which images are taking up space as well in, in like the grand scheme of media consumption. Cause although like, I don't watch TV anymore, barely. Right. I, there's still so many people that that's their main form of consumption. And, and like, as that pie gets smaller or even bigger, the way it's distributed, isn't just about, this individual gets his cookies, gets his awards, gets his streams, gets his accolades from the culture. It's also, um, you know, uh, scaring the holes doesn't get to get to influence the, the, the world of hip hop like maybe it should because it has to share with so many other things. Um, but and, and, and also because in order to attain success, just like the title track sort of, you know, raps about it, it needs to have a certain amount of sort of like pop accessibility to it. You right. Know, whereas obviously right. the the whole existence of that song is to not have pop accessibility, you know. Right. And then Scaring the Holes actually did really well though. If yeah, I'm not it mistaken. Did, it did do well commercially, you know, for, yeah. for both of them. It, probably better than Jack Harlow. So and and, and that and and there and that's the irony, right? That's another ironic thing is that if I'm not mistaken, and I, I, I this is all gleaming from like Twitter, you know, Twitter scrolls, but so many of the the big mainstream rappers are struggling to sell tickets, not getting a ton of streams, et cetera. And it is the underground indie, um, uh, more more challenging, um, interesting hip hop acts that are at least making their money back, you know? Yeah, and, they're, they're, they're playing the long game. Yeah, they're playing, playing the long, long game. You know, but, but I mean, you know, even, even when you could say being mainstream was more viable, you know, toward the start end of the 2010s, um, and, you know, it, it wasn't to the point of exploitation and, you know, pop 
crossover, you know, EPMD, the crossover. I think there's a lot of people, you know, this has been sort of like a narrative for years that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're younger and you have no idea what the hell that song right. is, you should listen to that, <laughs> listen to that track. Um, but, uh, but still, you know, it's like these, these artists, uh, Fetty Wap, for example, who come with one hit and they have their moment and they disappear and they sort of like, you know, have that kind of like very, very tiny run. Um, you know, th th this, this has been a thing for a while. And in that period right. of time, you know, Danny Brown hasn't left, you know, uh, JPEG Mafia has only gotten bigger and more relevant. Uh, there's right. a lot of underground rappers who have just sort of steadily been building their cult followings and are now enjoying the fruits of, yeah. of that labor at and, this point. And, and now that's what everybody, if they, they're they smart, that's what they really want. They don't want um, it, the irony of uh, J. Cole's, not the irony, it's not the irony, it's the, the, the prescience, I think is the word I'm looking for. Of J. Cole's diss to um, Lil Pump now some almost 10 years ago right. uh, on KOD, where he's basically saying, you're going to be on uh, Dancing with the Stars or, or Love and Hip Hop. That, that dude literally, years. never mind the track, <laughs> that dude literally made a YouTube video sitting down with him and trying to explain that to his face. <laughs> <laughs> he did, he went the extra ten miles. He, he really just... did. You can't you can't be mad at him for not trying to like uh, live his live his politics. He said, "I'm right. gonna sit down with this brother and I'm explain to him how he's got not just me fucked up, but the whole game fucked up." And right. here we are, however many years later. And Cole, who I've never been a huge fan of, right? Um, I like some Cole, but I like newer Cole. It's interesting. And Cole's probably one of the like, usually you like the I like their early stuff. I, th I think his, like, I think his new record is one of his best. Yeah, he's definitely gotten better over time. Yeah. Um, but it's also his. I think more the smarter rappers, the smarter mm. Mm, the rappers who have the capacity to think more critically about their careers. Yeah. Gotta yeah. look that, at Jay Cole. That, that's an important delineation because there are a yeah. lot of rappers who quote unquote make ignorant music, but they know that they're being exploited in the music game and they know how to sort of, you know, use that to their best interest. And they know right. the importance of like owning their own stuff, even if they're not making, you know, the next T-Pad. Because, you know, look at the end of the day, uh, there, there are some very conscious records put out by rappers that have shit business you know, <laughs> at, uh, acumen, honestly, and and, and yes. frankly, are getting or, totally or people that over. act conscious, and and you, once you you start those interviews, you're like, oh, you know, that that the, is the, that as well. The, the, and then there's a, uh, you know, but yeah, going back to like, so I'm sure uh, the baby would love to have J Cole's career, sure, even for that wave he had a couple of years ago, that was a a, a, a blip on the radar compared to the the trajectory that Cole's been able to have um and bringing it back to like the the conversation about you know white rappers so Cole is such a unique figure in that he's had that longevity grown it slowly and kind of gets to has a great influence on like hip hop explicitly um but will his ideas will his music be able to impact collective culture. Hmm. And I think that's that's a thing about hip hop that when I talk to going back to my mentor, Dr. Ball, because Dr. Ball is a, you know, he's an older Xer, right? So he's like, I'm, I grew up under hip hop. He was making hip hop in that moment. You know right. what I'm saying? Like he's of the age of the oldest generation creating hip hop. And in, in their moment, he explained to me with them, they thought they were about to win. Like they thought this was black people, black youth culture, uh, black liberation ideology. We're about to win. Hip hop is the vehicle through which we are going to mobilize black people, mobilize thought in action, uh, thought into action. And did not fully foresee how commercial, corporate, capitalist entities would, you know, kind of pluck them out one by one, reorganize them in such a way that, nope, you all are just now part of our machine. Look look what we did for you. You're now part of our machine again. Um, but the, the original reason why he thought that was because hip hop <clears throat> was such a ubiquitous penetrating force for not just like black folks growing up in these, you know, urban population centers, 
but for black people across the country. And then this white youth culture that was being awakened to these ideas. Mm. And that's what made it so dangerous and why su- such a challenge was thrown up in those first, you know, that first decade of rap music before we get into like the, I think by the late nineties is when the corporation set fully kind of like, all right, we got this under control. You know, you go here, you go here, you go here. Um, and so what I, what I think is lost now and what the, the most deleterious effect of a Jack Harlow does is it, takes us further and further away from the capacity for hip hop to mobilize and affect youth culture like it used to. Hmm. And, you know, at this point, I'm kind of over it. I think we talked about this. Like, it's a, it's a wrap. Like, we, we tried, you know, we failed. If you have progressive ideals in politics, um, you made a, a, a tweet that made a lot of people angry years ago about how, like, name me some conservative artists that are actually making good art. Right. And it's like, no, that's just not... <laughs> That, you know, so like part of being progressive is that you are constantly in negotiation with with old things to make them into new things. Mm. You're, you you create a new thing, a great idea. It will eventually be co-opted and then you have to create another one. Mm. And so maybe that is, you know, Tizo Touch now. Maybe that is Afrobeat. You know, maybe that's something I can't even conceptualize at this point that, you know, my that Gen Alpha is going to bring to the table. Right. Um. But it's not hip hop anymore. Hmm. And I think I'm just I think we're just really bitter about it. <laughs> I think I'm just pissed. Well, and I want to uh, talk about it. <laughs> I, I know I can't take up all your time. I want to get into two kind of like major topics that your video gets into. Uh, the, one of which I think you're kind of like referencing a little bit there. One thing you talk about in the video is like, it, you know, one one thing we may in fact be doing right now is just like as we're having this maybe futile discussion about white rappers, we're, we're literally just standing on hip hop's grave and nothing that we're saying or talking about or nothing that even Jack Harlow is doing even matters. You right. know, it's like the writing's on the wall. And, you know, you were talking about your own experience uh, through your kids uh, and them not even like really even embracing hip hop in that way and, you know, favoring more rock music or whatever. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to know your thoughts because, you know, while you don't exactly sort of like act as if you know what's going on or sort of like, you know, uh, how exactly any of this is going to go. But, you know, knowing what we know about capitalism, knowing what we know about kind of the direction of the music industry and racial dynamics in America, how do you see all of those factors working as we potentially move forward into an era where hip hop is not the zeitgeist? And you have black artists embracing other genres of music where, and, and this is ne- not necessarily a connection you made in the video, you know, one thing that's been able to make hip hop work in so many black artists favor and has prevented sort of like whiteness from impeding at the level that maybe it could is that there are certain elements of the sound and the genre and the culture that once you apply it to a white face, it doesn't work. You know, it just kind of, it feels off. It doesn't feel right. Yeah. Maybe it sort of works for somebody who is as clueless as like a Tom McDonald fan, you know, but the thing is like, uh, that's, that, that's, that's still not too many people. Yeah, we, it's, we'll it's, do it's, it's, a, it's enough people, but it's still not too many. Right. Um, you know, once you see black artists who are sort of like moving out of that space and are competing in lanes where people are going to see white people doing the same thing and not have an issue with it because mm-hmm. that barrier is not there which Oh, it's kind of weird that that white guy's making rock or something, you right, know, or making right. this genre music or that. Um, with, without that sort of like barrier or sour taste hitting you, and there's like an even more, maybe you could say uneven playing ground because, you mm-hmm. know, just because a black artist enters into a white space, there's still going to be that kind of like internalized bias of people to consume art from artists or people who they sort of see themselves in, you right. know, or they see themselves represented by to some degree. You know, it's like... Um, how, how, how do you think, you know, again, how all of that could possibly play out as maybe hip hop is falling off a little bit and maybe a, a younger generation, just like every young generation does, they try to, you know, reject that and embrace something different, right. uh, a new sound, a new style, a new direction, a new something in order to kind of like make themselves separate from those who came before them musically. So... 
I think that'll end up being like a, a kind of a dichotomous thing that, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to just embrace hopium here as the kids will say, hmm. and believe that the youth are better off. Hmm. Um, I think there's something to be said, and this is not a, a line of argumentation that I'm known for, but there's something to be said about the way that, uh, Hip, so you spoke to like it doesn't quite work with the white with the white guy, right? Certain elements of hip hop, most elements of hip hop don't quite have the same impact. Yeah, and yeah. There's, because there's of, a reason that we all internally cringe when we like look at a guy like Slim Jesus, right? Or or like right. or like again, Lil Mabu, who is just like using not just hip hop, but like you know he's he's one of these white kids that saw drill music on the internet and sees it as blood sport. Yes. And it's like, look how cool this is. Look how violent right. this is. Look at how, you know, insane this is. Oh, man, they're shooting each other. They're doing this. Right. They're doing that. You know, he's looking at it like it's cowboys. It's that boy. And, like it's cowboys and Indians on the TV, yeah. you know, in, in the 1950s. And, it's, it's, and he wants to jump in that and play, too. And it's like, <laughs> that, and it's, it's, and, and, and it's, and it's weird. It's, it, weird. It's, it's, it's weird. It's dangerous. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely level. weird and um, dangerous. And, and, but like, and so like, and so there's the, there's the, there's two things that, are, that, that can happen here. Um, so that imagery exists with or without hip hop. One thing that like, I get frustrated with, you know, your black conservative bootstrap, you know, Ben Shapiro type. Well, hip hop is the reason why black people crime da 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 da. And it's like crime existed before hip hop, right, right. and it looked exactly the same. The right. fashion was different, maybe, but the functional elements of how crime worked and how dysfun communal dysfunction worked existed well before hip hop. Will exist after hip hop. However, hip hop made it an aesthetic, and it defined blackness and specifically black masculinity for a generation at this point. And so that had a lot of deleterious effects. This is something I kind of get into in the, in the Kanye videos, you know, that kayfabe is like, you know, you cannot exist black man. You cannot exist outside of this aesthetic paradigm that we have manufactured on your behalf and have sold to the whole country. So that's you now. Right. So as you get Lil Yachty making a, 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 a Pink Floyd <laughs> remaking dark side of the moon, basically, Sure. Right. Um, and you have, uh, again, Tizo and all these other figures saying, OK, we're going to take some elements of this cultural aesthetic and we're going to pair them with all these other things. We're kind of literally break the mold on how these young black folks can look and experience the world. I think there's a lot of opportunity in that for things I can't even conceptualize, but positive, good things that I can't even fully conceptualize myself for how young black people define themselves apart from hip hop. Mm. Um, and while hip hop either maybe, maybe hip hop dies and is reborn in some way, maybe it just expands or maybe it just becomes the thing. Maybe it becomes what jazz is to hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Where like nobody, like very few people listen or even like engage with jazz. But if you listen to hip hop, then jazz is still alive. Right. Right. Um, and then on the flip side, God willing, the, the, these white youth that are consuming hip hop from a purely uh, from a pure consumption standpoint and not thinking about the grand ramifications of that consumption. They are Slim Jesus thinking this looks cool. I want to ma get me a gun. I want to go do a uh, hood rat shit with my friends. <laughs> when you kind of remove <laughs> when you kind of remove or at least make it so much harder to quantify and like uh, package blackness as it has been via hip hop. When you make that less of a of a perfectly corporate backed you know product, it becomes harder to just sprinkle throughout the culture. And now people have to be at a minimum more active consumers. Maybe you know what I'm saying. Um, and the 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 zeitgeist. Probably still, you know, continues, but it has to be there's an opportunity for disruption that's coming or that we're already maybe in. Do, um, do, do you think that like, you know, this disruption or whatever this is, is are we seeing the first sort of like 
you know, tastes of it through Tizo Touchdown or through like, you know, XXX Tentacion doing like a, an acoustic emo album or like, right. you know, through Playboy Cardi and these rage artists embracing like almost more of a rock vibe and having all these like super distorted tones and guitars yeah. in their songs or, you know, bands like Paris, Texas, for example, that sort of like, you know, marry elements of punk music, but also rap music as well. Is Are, are these the first steps that we're seeing here or, or do you think something completely disconnected from even all of that? Is, is what's going to define this this next wave. It's, I don't, so I think they, a lot of people were talking about, um, shout out to Backwash, who, re, who uh, uh, Instagram uh, hell yeah. uh, reposted me, right? They may not be, it may not look exactly like what's happening now, um, but I definitely think it's happening. Hmm. Um, I, I think that is, where at a minimum the future of interesting black music is going hmm. um you know uh and it's going to ha- and it's going to still be like that's the interesting thing like people say well, it's not black music because it's not x y z hip-hop whatever like no it's going to still be black you, right. you don't listen to paris texas you know uh tizo without catching all the blackness still within the music but it's just kind of broken out of the 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 you know the corporate sponsorship uh framework well you and know, so not to interrupt you but i think i think I, I i this is an interesting detour also something that i think is important to kind of address here because there is this like perception of like what is black music what is white music what is perceived as like black what is perceived as white in terms of like sound and aesthetics right. you know will these artists be perceived as black artists when they're making white music uh there are rappers who you know, you didn't necessarily say explicitly in the video, but like colloquially or sometimes as a joke online, uh, people will bring up, you know, artists like Logic or artists like Childish Gambino or artists like Hops and be like, oh, well, that's a white rapper, you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. But the thing is, like, you know, when you make that joke, there's a lot of people who will nod and agree and sort of get what you're talking about, though. No, right. that is a black rapper who's making black music. But because of like who they're influenced by, be it Eminem or be it like, you know, the nerd rap culture that, you know, guys like MC Chris, who I, I love that you shouted him out yeah. uh, in the video, sort of like pushed out there. They're perceived by audiences, uh, sometimes both white and black, as a, a white artist or an artist who makes a white sound, regardless of like what their race is. You know, so it's like, so I, I, think I, I, I don't I think know exactly what I'm asking here, but there is like that weird perception there. And where do you think it comes from and how does it get broken? I, well, I don't think it gets broken because mm. I think it just has a, a just a toxic discourse mm. is, is really because like, you but know, it, but I, it does I, come from a real presumption that people have. It does. It, well, because because it because it, it's truest mm. like so take a Donald Glover, right? Take Childish Gambino, who I, I shit on so much, but I'm a huge fan. I can't you can't people you can't shit on anybody as much as I do. If I, I shit on a person enough, except for Drake, if I shit on the person enough, it's because I, I really do like them on, on several levels. Mm. So uh, if you listen to one of the reasons why I liked even the old Childish Gambino, that's very cringe now. Like, I love That's the funniest moment in the video is his house cat bar, the house cat punchline. That shit is hilarious. Um, it's because he was speaking to a particular black experience in his music that had not been allowed to enter into hip hop. Mm. The cul-de-sac, that suburban black, de- somewhat detached from blackness, trying to reclaim it, being forced to survive whiteness experience is a black experience and will then make you accessible to white, you know, white audiences. And the sound is going to be different. But to me, that's still black music. Um and the, the fan base and the discourse is what makes it toxic hmm. um, because, you know, going forward, I called uh, Awaken My Love gentrified funk because <laughs> because I was like, I, I've listened to Gil Scott Heron. You've heard Gil Scott. We've heard I've Funkadelic. Heard, We've heard, Mag- yeah, heard Maggot Brain. Yeah. So I was like, this is this is cute. I, I like this enough, but also. Mm, it's missing, you know, this may have been out, out of, for, from my perspective, this is out of his real, like, range of abilities. I but mean, look, it's, 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 a, a, it's a good audience. album. It's got the grooves, but it doesn't really have that kind of, like, free, open, explorative energy yeah. that a lot of great, you know, like, if you're a real funk fan, 
You're yeah. not used to these like little three minute vignettes that are like, right. you know, it's got a super concise pot. It's, you know, you're used to not enough coke and heroin in the production right, exactly. process. You're, you're, you're not, you're used to James <laughs> Brown screaming his brains out over like this, you know, expansive, you know, eight minute thing. And he's going on about how he's a sex machine. That's the wild funk energy. Yes. Yes. So, so I think it's completely fair to say that, you know, Charles Gambino, Gambino has white is white people, you know, white people hip hop. But I don't I just think that shouldn't mean that the connotation shouldn't be as demonstrably negative, you know, because yeah. like by by that same connotation, so is Tribe Call Quest. Sure. You know what I'm saying? So is the roots. The roots are freaking house band for Jimmy Fallon. Sure. I, I love them, but like that's <laughs> kind of cringe, you know? So it's like, you know, that the the discourse is more toxic than it needs to be in, in that particular argument. The roots in Childish Gambino and in Tribe are all still making black music. Mm. It just has enough features to get a wide, you know, alternative hip hop, you know, white based fan base. Mm. Whereas going back to what we said earlier, the Ghetto Boys during their like same era as as a as a Tribe, you know. Um, I don't know CMP. I, mean, I don't even know if you know about them. Uh, like so. that's a that's an Atlanta, that's an Atlanta Bay. Like at the same time, Outkast is dominating all of music coming out of Atlanta. CMP is like an entire camp of like grimy, just like dirty South gangster rap. This is some of the greatest stuff you've ever heard. Never made it out of you know the SEC conference. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And like both of making black music, one has accessibility to this white fan base. Me and Lil Bill, shout out Lil Bill, you know what I'm saying? We joke all the time about, you know, how he's a version. Like we make the, we've literally made several videos, the exact same video, but mine, because of who I am and my sensibilities and aesthetics, is going to be much more palatable to a white audience, you know? It's just how it is. You know, what What do you say of, and, and you bring him up earlier, so I, I think he's important to mention Drake. You know, artists that wouldn't necessarily get like clocked as a white artist that makes white music or whatever. Right. But like, y- which is ser- interesting because, like, well, the, the, you know what <laughs> I'm already going to say, but <laughs> you know, th- there is a certain sort of like specifically, almost specifically white appeal there because, as you've noted in videos about him before, he completely strips out of his music any sort of connection to any any connection whatsoever to the struggle that it's like born out of socially uh, to the point where it is just pretty much pop music. So, I mean, even if it is genuinely hip hop and it is genuinely back black music, um, it's, it's not exactly like, as again, you've said in videos, it's not about or even vaguely in reference to sort of like the black experience. If there is any struggle there, it's Drake's personal struggle and, Right. Attaining and his, maintaining his, fame, and that's pretty much it. Or his struggle his, against some girl who's ruining his Bahamas trip. Right. This 24-year-old he's dating still for some reason. Um, yeah, Drake is such a conundrum there because because Drake's Drake's sonically still making very black music, right? Uh, he, and, and and in very a way, purposefully he's, in a way. <laughs> he's kind of becoming he's kind of becoming Eminem in a way because you know he's dominated so much in this generation that for white and black alike, he's becoming a window to hip hop and is, you know, giving people their first impression of the genre so that Mm -hmm. when they hear him and they see how he's categorized, they're like, well, that's what this sounds like. Now I know when I hear this, that's what this genre is. And maybe at some point when I go to make it, I'm going to sound like this guy because this was my first perception of what hip hop was. I'll never forget the Lil Dicky interview where he said Drake was his favorite rapper and it just clicked. Right. Like no, it, 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 it was, makes sense. And a lot of, and a lot of Jack Harlow's early stuff sounds like Drake. Yeah, I've been calling him white Drake since I realized who he was. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, that's, uh, so like going back to what we were saying earlier, Donald Glover's by comparison, Fred Hampton, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like when <laughs> you Drake, listen to Do- to Drake, to Drake <laughs> like who was also an influence of him. Like you can't deny that Drake influenced Donald Glover early childish Gambino's music. Sure. But like he he, you know, he gets a lot of shit for some of his isms 
around his blackness and, and, and uh, you know, per, uh, what's the word? Appropriately. Uh, but like, there's still so much effort put into engaging with the, that struggle, those black experiences, whereas Drake has all of the sounds and probably a bigger black fan base, but none of the connective tissue. None of the none of the risk taking around the topics when when Macklemore is making more overt pro black music than Drake, <laughs> you're gonna get another text, and I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> maybe quite joke about. Well, that. I mean, yeah, I I I, th- I think the important thing to note here is that n- nothing that anything that we say is in all these artists, nothing is a one size fits all analysis of anything. You know, you have white artists that are making more conscious music than black artists and vice versa. And, you know, everybody's all over the map. But I mean, you know, we're just trying to, like, get a conception of, like, you know, where all of this is going, really. But so here's a here's a key thing. And it kind of really also ties to. It's it's a point I think I've been missing in the conversation. I'm happy just uh, I kind of like got. Hip hop is. Is is really valuable to to black people for a lot of the reasons I've talked talked about right and it's it's almost like there needs to be some tithe there's there's a tithing that is not happening with a Jack Harlow even a Drake etc in that okay i can only make hip hop hip hop only exists because of the shit that black people have been through in this country period it doesn't exist without those struggles, that oppression experience, the ongoing problems, right? But by some caprice, uh, you know, some blessing of creativity, the confluence of all the forces creates hip hop within these black spaces. And it's fucking amazing. And everybody wants a part of it. But we, we also don't want to have, like Lupe did an interview with somebody asked him, would you give up hip hop if it meant that, uh, you know, all the issues that created hip hop went away. And Lupe was like, yeah, of course, in a heartbeat. What are you talking about? And the person interviewing was like, nah, I wouldn't. He was like, what are you talking about? You you mean like all this stuff, the, the, the violence, the dysfunction, et cetera, you would keep that just so you could have hip hop? Like, hell no, in a heartbeat, I wouldn't do that. And and also as a creative, like Lupe would find some other way to be creative. You right, know, it's like right. just please believe hip hop is a set of aesthetics and sort of like you know musical criteria that you can operate inside of or outside of. You know, just because right. hip hop gets taken away doesn't mean creativity gets taken away. Right, and, but and so then you have but to a to a typical white fan, as you alluded to earlier, they can find Eminem and then have hip hop. Right. And have to and have to go through no, like when you go to even a guy with a sketchy of passes, MC Search, and all these figures before Eminem, they had to um, offer, for lack of a way of putting it, you know, these nominal reparations in order to participate in the culture and the music. There was a nominal, not what it needs to be. You know, people are gonna get mad at me for saying that. Not what it needs to be, but there's this, there's this nominal acknowledgement. That as I enter into enjoying this art form born out of sheer dysfunction and pain, I'm going to I'm going to offer a a blessing and offer a token of my appreciation. And I'm going to deal with the cognitive dissonance of being white here. Like if you're if you're if you're a Kendrick fan, you're a white Kendrick fan. When Black of the Berry, I don't know when Black of the Berry drops in 2015 as a white Kendrick fan. What is you what do what do you walk away? I'm not asking you in particular, but like that had to be. Or God willing, it was some type of experience that grew your typical white Kendrick fan into something a little better around these issues. But when you have a a Harlow, a Drake uh, insert figure here that says, you know what? None of that stuff is important. Let's get the party started. You know what I mean? Let's 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 you know, let's just groove. Let's just vibes, man. And it's like, okay, you could do that. But you're selling us short. We're not getting everything out of this equation that we have literally earned and deserve. So please don't do that. <laughs> you right. know? And, 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 you know, and the thing is like, not to sort of like rain on the sort of creativity or expressions that people want to make, because even at the root of hip hop, there's always been just sort of like party music, carefree music, so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, you probably recall around the two thousands or so, 
Um, and, and maybe this is like what we need to get into next, because I think this is like, you know, really the problem that uh, is, is kind of plaguing this whole thing. You know, I, I think you bring up white rappers as like the conversation point. But as you sort of inferred earlier, underneath that, it's the commercialism, it's the capitalism, it's the exploitation, you know, industry wise. But I remember around the 2000s, Chuck D doing maybe it was like a Hot 97 or a Breakfast Club interview or something saying like, you know, there's always been party music. You know, he was he was saying on air, Chuck D was saying, but now it's like it's off kilter. You know, it's like the conscious stuff doesn't get played anymore. The stuff mm. that's like politically aware doesn't get played anymore. And now it's just like, you know, gangster this, banger that, party this, club this. It's like, you know, there's no room for the commentary. Yeah. There's no room for the stuff addressing the struggle that, you know, has also been pivotal. And now we're sort of moving further and further away from that. The first rap song I memorized the lyrics to was called Self Destruction. I don't know if you recall this. It was a super, it was like a, you know, remember in the, the 80s and 90s, there would be the super songs. So like, we are the world. Mm -hmm. um, so self-destruction um, was like, Terrorist One, uh, fuck, I'm going to Google it when I stop talking. But my point is, it, you know, even though I would probably cringe at it now, because it's probably a bunch of like, pull up yourself, pull yourself up by your bootstrap bars. Right. Um, at 12, <clears throat> That song was like a huge hit, and it was just about uplifting black people and uh, divesting from negative behaviors. Sure, and it was like a number one hit everywhere in hip hop. And you, you also still had I don't know, um, not just tried, but like uh, who did Tennessee, 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 Zingle Lama Duty was the name of the album, uh, Arrested Development. Um, he had all these other, that, yeah, he's completely correct that there were these other elements. So if you took hip hop, if you wanted to engage with hip hop, you couldn't just party all the time. Right. You had to sit down and hear Karis one lecture you about, uh, racism and stuff. You had to sit down and hear Chuck D tell you Elvis was a, was a hero the most, but he's never been, you know what I'm saying? Like you had right, to do right. that if you wanted to do hip hop. Right. Um, and then now, like now they just, it's kind of like, <laughs> I don't smoke, but it's how, what I think they've done to like weed, I guess, where they've just made all of the, can we do that? I don't know if we twitch. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. But like anything that they said, look, we're going to, you know, take all of the, the most useful parts out of it and just give people exactly what they want from this product. Right. That has happened where, you know, the radio could play um, MC Hammer um, and, uh, you know, Again, you know, public enemy in the same like hour block. Yeah, and it's now fine. That never happens, and it's fine. And people were used to it. it right. Like that's another thing that we don't think about is people will often argue us because people don't want to hear that. Da, da, da. Like no, the the mediums to which we engage with the music are they do impact our brains and how and our tastes. Hmm. So if you never are challenged to hear, you know, conscious hip hop, you of course you're not going to develop a taste for it. But, you know, 20 years ago, again, these other songs that were conscious hip hop records were huge hits, dance party hits, self-destruction. You should do a, 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 you do a reaction. No, no, don't do a reaction to it. It'll get you drug. But <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get, I'm going to, I'm setting you up. I'm sorry. But like, if you listen to it though, it's a, it's a party song still. Right. It just happens to be talking about stopping black violence in, in the hood and, and putting down guns, et cetera. Um, so yeah, like that's completely true. And that's only as hip hop becomes this purely commercial. One of the things we're going to, we're going to return to is when I, when I make my, what happened to rock video. Cause one of the points I glossed over that I really, I, I, I knew it wasn't fit for this video, but it says something is how rock was this alternative radical subversive force for a long time. And went through the same exact thing that hip hop's going through before it died. Yeah, you know, and that's and no, it's, it's, and, it's absolutely true. There's there's actually decade to decade parallels in terms of like the level of exposure and popularity and so on and so forth. You know, like the '90s for hip hop is when archetype wise is when you were getting your Zeppelins and your Hendrixes and your Pink Floyds and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And, you know, from which everybody sort of like holds in high art regard and now borrows from. And then from there, it just kind of gets more and more watered down and commercial and so on and so forth. But, yeah. you know, kind of bring this out into a more abstract and broad sense. 
you know, what we're ultimately talking about with this video that you've just come out with is like the repeated and continual way in which commercialization of, you know, uh, roots music and underground music and any kind of like cultural beginning of anything, the true meaning of it and whatever sort of like commentary or social awareness it came out of gets stripped out of it as it gets marketed and engineered to appeal to a wider and wider and wider audience, whether you're mm -hmm. talking about rap, whether you're talking about punk music, whether you're talking about metal, whether you're talking about um, some forms of reggae, whether you're talking about even American roots, folk music and country too, you know, which yeah. like, I mean, this look at the state of country today, look at the way, you know, folk music and its traditions have sort of been like, you know, laundered into singer songwriter music. And <laughs> now rather than, you know, having like your Woody Guthrie's who are talking about sort of economic struggle and, you know, the dust bowl and so on and so forth. And, you know, you fascism and economic inequity, you have everybody strumming a car, a guitar, singing about their last breakup. You know, yeah. or like, you get the guy that went viral last month, the, the fat cats of DC or whatever. Right. He's right talking right, about right, well, right. Yeah. welfare. Yeah. We should know people getting welfare. Oliver Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which, like, which is like, you know, again, the state of folk music and country and singer songwriter music, you literally have these guys lining up to listen to this dude because he's like, oh, he's a good old boy. He's a, you know, he's, he's uh, just like me, but he is literally parroting a, a one percenter talking point taking <laughs> shots at poor people and it's like how how are, how are we as the audience lining how are we as the average person you know the, the every fucking redneck lining up to listen to that song probably knows somebody who's on food assistance and yet and yet you're talk lining to up him. talk to him anthony <laughs> <laughs> and yet you're lining up to be like yeah fuck those yeah, guys fuck you know? those guys it's a yeah it's a and that and i think therein lies why it you know some people are like what bring why you bring race into it and you know why does everything have to be political and it's because you suck it's because you guys suck like you don't <laughs> you don't realize how when you strip those things out of the music you are doing the work of these corporate entities and these capitalist entities that entail use that against you mm -hmm. and it hits us first it hits black people first you know what i'm saying so like we need you to become we we need you to listen not just to um uh going back to kendrick right we need you not just to listen to you know pop the, the bottle song we need you to listen to black of the bear we need you to listen to um so much of t-pab and hear what it's doing not so you could we don't i don't need you to come hit the streets in march I don't need you to, to you know, wear kente cloth and, you know, all this stuff. I just need you to elevate your critical faculties so that you are not so easily sliding into the call. So that when Al Anthony Oliver, whatever this guy is, makes that song and he gets to that section that you're like, hmm. It, like, if you could do that for us, if if if, if he could... I, I made the joke, like, you know, I, I talk, you know, we talk bad about Joe Rogan, mm. but I would die in the hill that if Joe Rogan was the worst of white political thought, God, the world, the world would be such a better place. If like the worst political, if like uh, the worst a white guy could be was Joe Rogan, <laughs> you know, that the Overton window for that is like grand utopia. <laughs> <laughs> well, world, well, the, the actu actu actually, I mean, I, I know that Joe has his good and progressive and agreeable opinions on on some things. You know, the, right. the thing is, I actually think Joe is more representative than what you're saying. You know, and right. the, the, the issue with Joe is not that he's like right wing or left wing or whatever. It's that he's fucking impressionable. It's <laughs> that whatever Joe is saying or thinking seems mostly to be based upon the last thing he read on the internet or the last person he had a conversation with, which truly actually is how a lot of white guys, you know, base, and base their politics. views and politics. I, I, I was, um, you know, this, this is kind of funny. Uh, I got asked a really interesting question. on. <laughs> no one's ever done this before. I asked, asked an interesting question on a dating app. And th this 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 fucking this fucking bitch's opener was uh, where do you get your news? That was literally the first question she asked me. And I mean, I told her, but she responded and said, 
That's a really good answer. Some guys say, I don't know. I just uh, ask people what they think is going on. And it's like, what? <laughs> that's that's how you find out what's going on in the world. You just go on a random street corner and you say, what's going on? What's going on? But the thing is, like, some people, they, they, they do base their politics and their perception of the world based on, like, the last conversation they had or the last opinion that they heard some random person say. And that's that that's no way to build – an understanding of 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 the world, and the thing is, like, and, if, and it gives if, a ton of power to the Rogans, but also to the music, to the to the to the arts culture, sure, to to like influence that. It's like, all right, the last thing I heard was, uh, you know, Drake's twenty one year old. I'm just gonna make her younger every time. <laughs> Drake's twenty one year old girlfriend is being being an asshole on this trip. I'm gonna think, man, that seems like a really serious issue <laughs> in the world right now. Um, yeah, and, and so you have Rogan, Rogan, because people get, you know, like, I think, like, Cornel West has been on Rogan, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, if, but if the, the next four people are, like, ex-Proud Boy administrators, it throws off the balance for them. Right, it it, um, it, it does. And the thing is, like, and, and don't get me wrong, and, you know, you, you do have a valid point in that, like, would, would, would I take Joe Rogan over... Uh, you know, the most angry, foaming at the mouth, white supremacist. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but you know, th- th- there's a certain danger with Joe because he'll just sort of say anything off the cuff. And the thing is, he yeah. has this massive platform. And and, and the thing is about uh, mm. the psychotic white supremacist is most people can clock that there's something wrong with that guy. You know, mm, most people yeah. see that guy. Sure, that guy does convince some people, but most people, white and black, like see that guy and they're like, I don't vibe with that. You know, yeah. Joe just seems so agreeable to just about anything uh, that most people sort of like have a neutral or somewhat positive opinion about him. And then all of a sudden he's just like, you know, the vaccines are fake and they're going to kill you. And it's like, <laughs> well, hold on. Well, it's, it's like, I, I know you're not a rabid right wing psychopath, but you do have 20 times the audience of the Nazi. And you yeah. just said this. And you said crazy, the, same, same you said the thing craziest that they, fucking thing that's going to that's going to frankly put a lot of people in danger. That I think what you're what you're getting at is. You know, bringing it full circle back to like the, the overall theme of the convo for, you know, uh run the mill white guy that gets like I can't I don't have the luxury of just seeing what happens with the news. So what are you guys li-? you know like right. I don't have the luxury of that. Right. I have to be explicitly engaged so that I can remain critical and <laughs> stay alive. The black right. bear way of putting it, you know, if I'm not aware of certain political uh, economic movements, that could mean, you know, a danger to me. Whereas, you know, if for a popu- a certain population when Donald Trump got elected the first time, they were like, hey, what's the worst that could happen? Right. And they were right. They, it, For them, that was a completely reasonable response because they were in a particular socioeconomic stand, uh, standpoint then, and they probably and that probably hasn't changed for them. Yeah, he, he doesn't it, present an imminent danger right. to their existence, whereas like somebody who is a part of a family – uh, that might want to immigrate at some point and maybe not have their family members shot as they're coming over the border right, right. Uh, might might have uh, a more... A slightly different r- yeah. response to it. Right. But at the same time, though, it also hasn't changed. It also doesn't make a difference to that bottom of the food chain community as well. Hmm. You know, it, it, when you go into, you know, the... when You look at, uh, what's her name? You also got people mad at you for saying her music was good. Sexy uh, Red. Sexy Red. You know, talking about being a Trump voter or whatever. Right. And it's like, I, I don't give a lot of energy to like wanting to like make the 30 minutes FD signifier take down of sexy reds politics. That seems really stupid. But I do think her political stance represents the way that, you know, poverty and, and strife uh, creates disengagement with the political apparatus because one of the classic memes I would see like on Facebook. So take it with a grain of salt. We're talking about Facebook. Um, is like, it'd be a picture of the hood and it's like the hood under Trump, the hood under Obama. And it's the same, right. you know? And so, you know, that means that when you, again, trying to bring it full circle, when you evoke the spirit of that, of that culture, or when you, when you partake of it to make money, um, to make, to make your, your bread, 
then you you leave a token uh, of appreciation somewhere within the, you know, somewhere where you are. Um, you know, the the point that I stand on mo- more, you know, like I actually didn't hate uh, for all the dogs. Right. Um, I probably liked it more than most. I really when we talk, I really like that freaking uh, come rescue me song. I love that shit. That was my jam for like a couple of weeks. Everybody hated it. I was like, what are y'all talking about? This is finally good drink. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> you know, so like I'm not as big a Drake cater as people think, but I will never forgive his, uh, you know, the way he moved when people were being critical of him during the, the Black Lives Matter uprisings and stuff mm-hmm. like that, because it spoke to such a a com- it was just so to me. It was so disrespectful to the to the the historical context of what hip hop was and is, and and signaled the death of it. That he could be at this top tier position and have such bad politics around these issues. Um, you know, uh, it, it was just like, how can you say, well, I don't need to talk about it in my music? That's the most valuable. That is what you are. Right. If it's the you, best if thing you, you could do. If that's the best thing you can. Em, Nobody, Eminem had better politics at that point. Em, Eminem put more on the line. Right. Politically, uh, in his in his at the at the height of his career, I think that was Eminem show when Mosh came out. Yeah. Right. Put more on the line in in his music than Drake. Now, of yeah. course, you could you could you know make arguments about what Drake's you know, got more consequences. Of it. I don't agree with that. I don't think there's any, like, I don't think Drake loses. Well, Drake probably does lose a handful of fans for becoming like, if, if anything, you know, any and all forms of polarization help Drake as, as we've right. routinely seen. Right. Right. So, you know, so like, so, so to me, that's the, that's the danger here is, well, not the danger. I don't think I can't even call it a danger. That is where, that is the cause of death. Um, for hip hop as the grand commercial enterprise from my perspective is that we have now gotten to the point of hair metal. We're at, we're right. at hip hop is in its hair metal phase. Right now it's literally just beats and whatever it's 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 just the bare bones of the groove has to be like this, the right. vocals have to be like this, this part has to be like this and there's no deeper meaning to it beyond that. Yes. At, 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 and, and just so we, just for people that are going to get mad at the grand commercial level. Yeah, at the grand because, at the grand commercial level. At the yeah, grand commercial level. Because there's so much interesting stuff still happening. There is. But if if you want to, if you if you are a casual person wandering into hip hop, and you know, aside from a handful of moments from maybe like Lil Baby, um, you're gonna get oh god, it's old head moments. But like, <laughs> I am so tired of everybody's future imitation on record. Like, yeah. I, I literally cannot tell the difference. Just let me get some gray hair to put on my the <laughs> filter real quick. I can't tell the difference between Yeet, Gunna, <clears throat> Lil Baby, um, you know, like all these all these guys that sound exactly the same on record. Their beats sound the same to me. And all the songs are two minutes long. I don't like um, I didn't know who Gunna was. I was alive uh, for this video. I can still I tell like, the difference, but give me a few years. Right. I, I checked out earlier, like the song, uh, the, the fuck you mean song. I love that. Don't even, that and I love that's a that banger. song. That's, that's a, banger. a banger. That's the one song on the record Lil, that I liked. Yeah. I thought it was Lil Baby this whole time. Oh, I thought, and is it Lil Baby? Who the fuck is Lil Baby? No. Um, you're not, are you, are you, are you uh, mixing up Lil Baby and Dub Baby? No, I don't. I, no, I'm trying to make sure Lil Baby is a guy. Yeah, Lil Baby is a guy. Okay, that's and, that's and, and okay. him and him and Gunna sure. have collabed. They, they they you know they sort of came up at the same time. Yeah, I just in my head, Lil Baby was a a like Lil Baby as a hip as a rap name sounds like a joke an old head would make. <laughs> <laughs> like it sounds like something you would make up to make fun of the fact that everybody has Lil or Baby in their name right now. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. You know, so I'm sorry. Sorry, right, let's little baby. I have respect. I respect. know you got to go in a few minutes. Let's let's yeah. let's let's make a viral moment before we we head out. A, a good viral moment. A I good viral moment. Because gonna... you know, it's because and, and maybe give the audience what they want in terms of you tearing me apart or something. We'll 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 we'll, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll set it up real easy, like on the tee. Okay. Well, gotcha. I'll, I'll put. I'm gonna I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna put it on the tee, 
and you can just like really like you know just like smack it with the bat and just go hard all right so here so here it is here it is am i allowed to or am i socially or to hip hop or to culture or whatever doing damage by telling everyone that actually no sexy red is really good ooh that's a, that's a tough one cuz i don't like sexy sexy red music <laughs> I, I I think it's I think it's really just so technically bad because I like ratchet shit. I love me some city girls who are also technically not all that great sometimes. See, I see. Um, I I like her more than city girls. I think she writes catchier songs. But they're so well. I haven't I haven't given her enough. Maybe I gotta really listen. I tried to listen to the last album, and there's some moments. She's she's inherited a a tradition that I think all the other like rap starlet girlies that have gotten popular. Everybody's trying to sound like, um, you know, peak Nicki Minaj, uh, uh, whatever, right? Like everybody's kind of doing like a pop, pop adjacent hip hop thing. I mean, I, 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 I kind of disagree because, like, you know, t- I mean, as she sort of says on her song, you know, female Gucci Mane, she, you know, she, she's, she's no, no, sexy's different. That's yeah, what no, I'm no, she's, she's different. She has that one bar in her new record where she's like, "I'm, I'm sexy, right? I ain't no singing ass bitch." I'm yeah, like, that's like, that's true. She's not a singing ass bitch. So I, I I love I love her for that. I think of um to go deeper, like baby mother, like that. I, I wish I wish we could switch them out because I think baby mama's technically uh, better. But I will say I can't. But I here's the thing. I don't think sexy red being popular is doing harm to hip hop. So I'm I'm allowed to like sexy red. You are allowed to like sexy red. <laughs> As the as the as the 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 clear authority on on all big things black, right, right, um, and and, and, hi- and hip hop too, and hip hop as the clear wow. authority of all things black and hip hop, I bestow upon you. My my the, audience is going to be rocked to find out it's okay for me to like it, sexy red. It's it's it is yeah because because the truth is I liked Kaya, sure. <laughs> I liked Trina. I did a whole video about this. You know, the thing is, like, I, I feel like there's a lot of people, especially, you know, white people in my audience who are, like, exposed to nothing but hip-hop Twitter and mm. are doing nothing but engaging every day in, like, the grind of, like, okay, take out one or two rappers. The rest you lose forever. Who's better? <laughs> is it Kendrick? Is it Cole? da 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 And the thing is, like... They they have no conception because it's not a part of the discourse of like ratchet shit, yeah. and you know that that sort of vibe and that sort of energy. And and look, I've had my moments as well where new iterations of that. I was like, no, 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 this isn't good. You know, and and I I think I think my biggest regret with that was was probably Waka Flocka Flames Flocka Valley. And oh. look at at that point. I was Ooh. I was I was into Dirty South stuff. I was into Lil John. I was into all like right. all that shit. But then when Waka Flocka came along, I was like, no, there's something wrong with this. But then yeah. like years later over time, I was like, actually, I kind of missed something. I, yeah, I the reappraisal of here. Flocka is definitely necessary because I I I was teaching at the time. And so like I was around the kids and they were on it. And right. I was like, no, <laughs> no children. <laughs> He's not. This is it, but like they played it, and I was like, "Yeah, like you, it's like you can't." Then I went and lifted weights. Like you can't stop. You know the thing that I think is happening here is as hip hop is dying as a commercial venture, everybody's trying to grab their piece of it, right, and say this is the sacred part of it. You know, look at it. This is it right here. So it's 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 Kendrick. It's insert underground figure here. Um, No, it's really Drake. Drake represented all of good and hip. You know, whatever. And so when you're like, but also this like really silly ratchet uh, nonsense is just as valid. It's like no, it's not valid because what? Because everybody there's this there's we're trying. It's kind of like a a power vacuum. You know, Mm -hmm. like you you topple a, a a dictator and then everybody wants to scramble for power. And for you, yeah, as, there's, there's as, no one single way to be good anymore. And, right. and, and the thing is, like, I, I, th- I think it, it comes from a place of people sort of like only understanding artistic quality as having one taking just one single sort of form, yeah. you know, yeah. um, 
And, it's, you know, and that's why people get confused when they say, when, when I tell them, you know, yeah, I'm enjoying this uh, about as much as like, you know, the last Kendrick record. I'm getting entertainment value out of it. I'm not enjoying it for the same reasons. Right. Of course. Right. Of course I'm not enjoying it for the same reasons. Right. But like, you know, there's more than one way to enjoy a thing. You know, I mean, if, if all music out there were trying to various degrees successfully and unsuccessfully achieve the same end or achieve the same goal, it would suck. Yeah. Everything would fucking it, suck. It, it, would, it, would, it would be so much less variety and less room for like, that's why we are where we are now, because they got everything down to a formula. And now people just uh, shout out to Volts guys who just did a video on um, Spotify's effect on music. And that like we're we're we've we've now we have a checklist. Does it have does it have eight oh eights? Does it have the 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 a trap beat? Right. Is it two minutes and thirty seconds or shorter? Right. You know, does it have the does it start with the hook? Um and like all these different checklists that we don't real so though that's like a really, really bad version. But another bad version is I want five T pabs a year. Right. You know what I'm saying? I want five exhibitions to try, uh, uh, fucking, I can't even talk about it. I want five um, Danny Browns a year, hmm. you know, versus I want a T-Pab and I want um, uh, Rhapsody. And I'm frozen again. You are. <laughs> um, we got to go anyway. <laughs> but you we got to like, go anyway. Yeah. Like, so the, the sexy red discourse is really um, amusing to me because... It's people not realizing how wrong they are while being very loud about it. Mm. And he's a, you don't have to like Sexy Red. You don't. But to, but to put the death of hip hop on Sexy Red is to completely be disengaged of like the last 20 years of what's been happening in hip hop. And let's be real, a little misogyny. Some, oh yeah, absolutely. A, I mean, that, that's the thing that pisses a, me off the most because uh, every, probably a lot. <laughs> everybody who is so angry that, you know, I'm, I'm liking her stuff, uh, are also the same people that get up my ass when I'm saying that, you know, uh, ignorant rapper A, B or C is just kind of okay to me. You know, right. I feel like we're, we're just kind of arguing different kinds of junk food, you yeah. know? And yeah. I just, I just thought this one was particularly fun to eat. But yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. You got you got stuff you gotta indeed, do. Indeed, indeed. Peace and blessings, everybody. Appreciate y'all stopping by. Uh, check out the video. Check out the video. We're <laughs> gonna we're gonna link to it down below. Of course, we're gonna link to the video down below. Um, check out the and, channel. Uh, check out the hip hop playlist. I think I have four or five. Vid- I got two Kanye videos. Nicki Minaj, Cannabis. This one. That oh, Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have I have I have a whole day's worth. You can finish your whole day. Hearing all of my hip hop takes. Oh, and of course Drake. I almost forgot about the Drake. Yeah, video. don't forget about the Drake video. Don't which forget is very, about the which Drake is very video. good about the way. Uh, by yes, the way. yes, yes. That's probably uh, maybe my second best now. I, my favorite is the cannabis video because that mm-hmm. one's like the you know that was true me coming coming through. But the the, the if you want to understand my entire ethos in terms of hip hop, I think I put it in the the Drake video. But peace and blessings. I gotta go. <laughs>